So good morning, everyone. Um, today I'm going to be speaking to you about the reading and writing tests of the SAT and ACTs. Um, and I'm going to be using the Collegify platform later on in this presentation as a guide. Um, there's a few things that uh, I'm going to tell you up front that I'll cover. First of all, a very quick introduction to what standardized testing is, which is really to lay the groundwork for some of the test strategies that I suggest um, you take on. Um, I want to reinforce for those that don't know um, or give you for those that um, that do the 2020 admissions picture and pick up on why paying careful attention to these standardized tests and making you sure making sure you pick the right one and the right approach within each test for the reading and writing and other elements is of crucial importance um, then, as per the fourth bullet point, I want to go through the differences between these tests themselves and also the differences between the questions in those tests. Um, finally, I will be taking you through the platform um, and showing you how the power of Collegify's analytics can actually help you become a better practitioner and test taker and really give you an edge over others who will be competing against you in on the final exam day. On my final slide, I'm going to talk about some of my personal, um, my personal views on the path to success, which um, if any of you have heard me speak at a Mindler conference online before, um, does encompass a more holistic strategy. Um, so I'll be touching on those points here as well. So first of all, what is standardized testing? Um, to really understand your approach, you have to understand the nature of the beast. Um, it has a long history that dates back to Harvard um, in the 19th century. And it is... Um, really rooted in the Stanford Bile intelligence test or the IT test. Um, and it was not long after that, that the first SAT test was administered, which was in the 1920s. These tests have always been technology led. And the key thing to take away from that is a platform like Collegify, um, especially with its use of machine learning and AI, is really germane to the nature of the test. Uh, these tests have always been leading the way by using computing power um, to process results. Um, and to my mind, it makes total sense to be continuing to apply that computing power to process the results uh, in order to give students, rather than just the test givers, but to give the test takers insights into their results. Now, the tests remained largely unchanged until 2005. Um, but what that means is that we now have around 4 million sittings, not necessarily different people, but 4 million sittings of the test as of the class of 2019. Slightly more in the SAT, as you'll see, 2.2 million as opposed to 1.8 for the ACT. Um, and this really is the first hurdle for sifting. Um, what it also means is that without specific preparation for this kind of test, it is very likely um, that students, however bright, if they're not familiar with what they're going to take or if they haven't been practiced in the test taking strategies, um, they will underperform compared to their college grades which takes us on to the admissions picture. Um, this is likely to be a bottleneck, guys, especially in the current COVID-19 environment. Um, as I've mentioned already, the competition is stiff. American students or students who have long since held, have their sights set on the SAT or ACT test will be putting in years of preparation. Um, and by comparison, 
uh, your grades uh, in the first bubble at the bottom, your grades and your essays, which is this, the third bubble, so the two blue bubbles, are fixed parts of your application. So once they're in, you can't change those. Whereas the advantage of the SAT ACT component it is, is that it is a movable and improvable part of your application. Um, I myself have seen scores move upwards of 300 points in the last academic year. I was tutoring full-time a professional athlete here who needed a, a homeschooling tutor to get him through his professional sports schedule. And when we looked at the difference that this would make for his future, um, it came down to being equivalent to the difference between him going to Florida State University uh, versus Harvard, Princeton or Yale. So um, it really is crucial to, first of all, choose the right test. And secondly, to apply yourselves in the most efficient way possible um, during these tests. So I'll be going into the detail of the reading and writing tests and helping you understand exactly which questions may be giving you trouble through using the platform um, and also hopefully also giving you an insight into which test might be better for you. So speaking of that last choice, um, the question of which test to take and why it matters is a crucial one and it's often underestimated. Students who uh, rush to do the ACT because they think it's science-based uh, or want to avoid science and rush into the SAT uh, are often caught short. Um, both parents and college applicants often do this um, and the implications of the differences of the tests are significant, and I won't go fully into them here, um, but there are comparisons worth drawing. So first of all, there are three common components that you'll see, um, reading, writing, and maths, um, both non and with calculator for, for the latter. Um, though there's only a specific science section in the ACT and it's a misconception that the SAT has no science in it. Indeed, you'll come across scientific passages within the SAT reading and writing tests. Overall, the SAT is a more detail-oriented, in-depth test with longer average question times and more complex and longer passages that suit those with a flair for lit history or literature. By contrast, the ACT is a much faster paced exam with question times averaging, averaging around 50 seconds compared to the SAT's 75 seconds. Uh, and it also tends not to have text with as much archaic or obscure language. Um, and I'll come on to that when I speak about the reading tests specifically. So it is fair to say that those who prefer the sciences to the humanities should sit this test. However, um, this shouldn't really be left to guesswork. Uh, I'd highly recommend that students and parents harness the powerful performance analytics of the Collegify platform to inform their decision through a diagnostic test, because there are plenty of quite logic-based questions um, that may throw off humanity students um, and may mean that uh, at the ACT test, which is less in-depth and requires less comparisons between texts, um, may be the better fit. Um, there is a diagnostic test available, as I've mentioned, um, and this will give you detailed objective advice as to which test the student's better suited to. Um, it uses machine learning and AI algorithms based on the data of thousands of students and, of course, your own interactions with the platform in order to give you uh, a very accurate understanding of which direction you should go in.
So the reading and writing tests, what will you be faced with? Um, well, first of all, there are five passages of texts. Now, these tend to be around uh, 800 words long. And you'll have around 10 to 11 questions per passage. Now, as I've already touched upon, um, the SAT test passages tend to be drawn from literature that can date back to the 19th and sometimes even 18th century. So that means if you're not comfortable with reading stylized, um, kind of slightly more archaic language, um, imagine something like Charles Dickens, for example, or a presidential speech by Thomas Jefferson. If that kind of archaic English um, presents trouble for you, and it isn't something that you can tackle either because um, your brain just doesn't work that way, or you don't have the lead time to start to read, I don't know, a couple of Jane Austen novels before you get down to test day, um, then I'd suggest that perhaps the ACT might be the better option. Um, you'll have one passage from a classic or to contemporary work of US or world literature, one passage or a paired pair of passages from either a US founding document, so this could be a presidential speech or um, from the debate um, within Congress, or a text in the great global conversation they inspired. Um, so expect things from people like Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King. There'll also be a selection um, which will cover topics that might not necessarily be scientific in nature. They're more what I call social scientific, so economics, psychology, and sociology, or some other science, um, social science, my, my mistake. And then finally, two science passages. It, this could either be a passage or a passage pair that you're asked to compare and contrast. And these examine foundational concepts and developments in the science of the earth, biology, chemistry, or physics. So there really is no mistake, no escaping <clears throat> having to analyze some scientific literature. And in fact, a lot of the passages will have um, diagrams or graphs underneath that you're also required to draw some conclusions from. Um, the important thing to say here is that knowledge outside of the information that's given to you is not required um, and if you're ever tempted to start inserting knowledge of your own on a topic that you know a lot about for example um, there might be a passage on the red shift of planets you might also love physics and cosmology and you might know a lot about red shift but to tweak the answer to the question in light of knowledge that you have but is not specific to the, the passage itself, that is part of the red herring strategy of these tests. It will actually mean that if the evidence that you're using is not based strictly within what's given to you in the passage, you will get the answer wrong. Um, when I first took the SAT um, and I have to admit, I was um, a bit of a nerd and a hardworking schoolboy. I had plenty of knowledge that I just was bursting at any moment to apply to the passages I was reading. And I came out with a really abysmal score, score in the reading and writing tests um, for that exact reason. Um, <clears throat> they are designed to assess your understanding of the evidence as it stands within these passages as hermetically sealed units. So please, please avoid the temptation to um, put your own knowledge in um, of whatever the topic might be. So the reading versus writing test questions, what will you actually be asked? Um, the broad categories 
tend to come up um, again, um, such as command of evidence or word in, words in context. Um, for the reading test, command of evidence simply means you're, it's testing your ability to find evidence in a passage or a pair of passages that best supports your answer to a previous question or serves as the basis for a reasonable conclusion. Um, what does that mean? It, it means that you will have been asked to find um, a paraphrase of something in, in the text. And then in the SAT specifically, they have these linked questions where the follow-on question asks you to then go back and find a choice of four different types or four different uh, examples of evidence to back that question up. So it could be facts or figures, statistics or a statement that might come later on in the paragraph or later on in the passage itself. Um, as a tactic here, guys, just ingrain the habit of spending extra time on these questions. If you do, if you do get to the point where you've had to skip an evidence question, so you've skipped a question that uh, that precedes it, do not then go through with the follow-up evidence question. It makes no sense to have a guess at that because if you've not been able to get the first part right, you're just inviting yourself um, to have a one in four chance in the next part. So if we are rushing through and we are running out of time and you are unable to get the, the preceding question right, and you know that, you know you've just had a guess, don't, don't uh, guess in the second part um, because you're, you're almost certainly going to get it wrong. That's time better spent on other questions. Um, you might also be asked to identify how authors use evidence to support their claims. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, some of these passages do have an informational graphic of some kind at the bottom. And don't miss that. You might be asked to find a relationship between that graphic, be it a graph or a table, and the passage it's paired with. Um, and this is usually simple stuff. Um, you'll be asked to find, um, you know, an average or a mean um, to do with things like a population of a certain animal. Um, so the non-scientists among you, you, you shouldn't panic. These are usually quite straightforward. The next category is words in context, and we'll look at some of these on the platform. Um, many FEC questions focus on important and widely used words and phrases across many different subjects. Um, and this part of the reading test focuses on your ability to use contextual clues in a passage to figure out the, the meaning of the word or phrase being used. So you don't have to know specifically what that word or phrase means. It's, it's actually um, a tactic I recommend is to really focus on what the context is in order to have a, an educated guess. Um, and, you know, have probably a 50% uh, chance of scraping that answer. Um, have a think about um, how it fits in terms of the style or the register or tone of the text. And that can also usually help as well. And finally, you might be asked to decide how an author's word choice shapes meaning, style and tone. Um, for the third bullet point, you will get these texts that analyze history or social studies or science. Um, these tend to be very broad questions and they may ask you to read about uh, a recent experiment in science um, and examine the hypothesis, for example, interpret the data. It could be about declining birth rates in China. Um, consider the implications. So draw some conclusions about what that data implies. 
Um, but again, be very careful not to mix up your own knowledge of the topic with the evidence presented to you in the text. That may quite often mean that you strongly disagree with the argument being put forward and with the interpretation of the data and the implications that come from that. If that's the case, but you're very clear on what the data and the implications are, that's only a good sign. It's only a good sign that you've been able to strongly interpret what's in front of you and you personally strongly disagree. That means that you're actually, you know that you're holding yourself back and you're only focusing on the text. So use that as a plus point in the exam to give yourself a boost of confidence. So the writing test questions, um, these also contain categories like command of evidence and words in context. Um, and this is really the focus on amending the sentences of written work. So spelling, punctuation and grammar rules here are critical. Questions that test command of evidence will ask you to improve passages um, and how they develop their information and ideas. Um, so you might be asked in these questions to add a sentence um, or remove an argumentative claim. And what you're really looking for in these questions is does it add anything new? Does it add anything that I, the imaginary reader with no foreknowledge, you might have foreknowledge of your own, but does it add anything for the imaginary reader who has no foreknowledge of this topic? Does it add anything novel? Or does removing it actually take anything away? Or has there been some repetition there? So again, very important to hold this ideal test taker or this ideal reader in your mind, someone who has no knowledge of this topic outside of what's there in front of them. As for words in context, you'll need to use um, the most appropriate word out of a choice um, based on the text surrounding them. Um, the idea being here to make the passage more precise, um, more concise or compressed, or to improve the syntax of the word order or the style or tone. And this could include editorial deletions or making certain additions. Um, but again, it's really important, and I'll come on to this, it's really important to have an overall understanding of what the main driving force or the main thesis of this written piece of written work is so that you can make appropriate judgments as to what to delete um, and what to add. If it was a funeral oration, for example, by um, a famous poet, uh, it would be inappropriate to start having light-hearted language added in to that funeral oration, which is, of course, a piece of writing or a speech given on the occasion of someone's death. So that obviously is an extreme example, but it gives you a kind of sense of how understanding the overall aim of the written passage in question can sometimes sharpen um, or narrow down the range of options that we have when we're thinking about inserting or deleting texts and phrases. Um, finally, there are some expression of ideas and standard English conventions questions. So expression of ideas um, ask about the organization of the passage and its impact. Um, so this could be deleting entire sentences and moving them around and you should look for the number codes within the text um, and think about the order of the argument. For this section or this kind of question, it really helps to make a short bullet point list with, if you can, just a word for each bullet point of how the argument flows. If you can do that, numbered of course according to the numbers of the sentences you're being asked to move around in the text. If you can do that quite often um, the way in which to rearrange it or not becomes clear. And then finally 
the bit I think that is the most dreaded, but uh, the one that gives the greatest room for improvement in the shortest time is about the standard English conventions of uh, punctuation. Um, this is, or these are questions about the building blocks of writing. So sentence structure, usage, punctuation, changing words, clauses, sentences, and punctuation to uh, from incorrect to correct forms. Sometimes there are some red herrings there that mean you do actually have a correct um, piece, of, uh, piece of punctuation there. Um, subject verb, verb agreement and common use and so on. Um, I would write out an example of each and every one of those as you encounter them whilst using the platform and just have a page of maybe 20 sentences, sellotape to the back of your door and just read through them once every morning. If you do that, you will get a perfect score in this question. There's no doubt. It's, um, it's a very, very easy part of the test to prepare for. So with that having been done, I will now just um, switch over to the Clergify platform and talk through how we can use the analytics to improve our verbal tests. So you should all now have in front of you um, the home page of the Collegify platform, which neatly has the time to exam date here, which has actually passed. I can, which you can update like so. So we now know we have 34 days until the exam. Um, we're waiting for a weekly quiz here. Um, which is really a great way of testing yourself live against other students and giving yourself an understanding of where you sit within a live cohort of students. Um, and if we click through to the, actually if we scroll down, we can see progress across the different sections. Um, so the English test is 15% through and the maths test is 11% through with an overall progress through the ACT in this case of 10%. So if we look at course, the next section, and we go to the section list, we can go to, for instance, the English test. We can see all the different subsections. Um, some of the things I've been talking about neatly listed here exactly as you'll find them categorized on the ACT test itself. Um, here are some practice tests that are being recommended for students and uh, the students in question. Um, if you look at the worksheets, they all have different beginner standard and advanced difficulty levels. And based on your diagnostic and based on your progress, the Collegify platform will learn from your level and it will give you the appropriate level of practice to be doing um, within each of these subcategories, which really is quite unique. So if we look at subject verb agreement, you can see that the same categorization is there. And for punctuation, um, clearly, this chap has not performed that well on the punctuation practice, so he's going to get another beginner level punctuation practice set before he's allowed to move on to the standard or the advanced. So going back to the section list, and Praveen will come onto this, um, we also have the same categorization, all of these lessons as well here in L. to take um, to bolster your um, to bolster your testing. Um, we also get badges like this, um, so basic two, um, then there's also advanced and 
uh, beginner. And these are color coded graded badges and emblems that allow you to understand where you sit relative to others taking the test. Um, and it's a really useful function um, along with the predicted score of actually understanding how ready you are for test A at any given moment. Um, there's a range of mock tests here as well, both official and um, Collegify produced. And what I really want to talk to you about is the um, the weekly exams or just the analytics in general. So I'm going to go to the detailed report of an ACT weekly exam. So first of all, it gives me the ability to share my results across a range of social media. It gives me my time taken and my percentage score and the number of incorrect and correct answers. Now, if you are interested in um, a specific section, so I might be a tutor now, for example, who is teaching the reading and writing section, um, I'm able to filter that here and focus on the questions that have been got wrong. And it might be clear to me that actually the English or language test along with the maths and science tests are the ones that need most work because this student's actually scored relatively strongly on the reading test. So that's the first level of granularity we're able to break down to. We can also go by question difficulty. Um, so here we can understand that um, there's a lot of careless errors being made under the medium question difficulty which is usually a sign for me that the student is working too fast, not reading the question properly, not checking their answers or guessing rather than skipping and giving themselves more time later. So that's actually a positive sign to be able to identify this. And you can identify this yourselves when you are, um, when you're going through your results. Um, and yes, as I said, we can also go by by, by section. Um, the time taken per question analytic is probably the most useful to both you as students and to me as a teacher. This really throws up some of the nuances of the test that are simply not captured by other platforms and not captured by certainly doing things on paper. The blue dotted line you'll see is your average time taken. Now currently, um, this student is moving 10% uh, too fast, I think. Okay, going back to what I, what I said before. Let me just double check the time. Yes, so you should be moving uh, at 40 seconds should be moving at 40 seconds per question. So the, the student's not only moving too slow um, as an average, um, there are quite a few questions that are being rushed through too fast and they're not always right. So I think um, the first bit of advice would be questions where you think you're right, double check them. So that's strategy number one that emerges from these analytics that are specific to the student. The second strategy that will again automatically improve the marks, having had a look at the results, is to stick to the known average. So they'll have to have a watch on their table. And once they go past a certain amount of time, I would say no more than 50 seconds, um, we just move on from that question because this question here question 12 it, it may be correct but it's what i call a false positive it's taken them two minutes and two seconds in a 40 to 45 second expectation time to get that question right now that could have been the additional one minute 15 taken for this question could have been applied to these three wrong answers here, which the student probably would have got right. 
I'd also call these false positives. And also, of course, even more disastrous is when you spend loads of time on a question like question 18 and you get it wrong. So do be aware that user utilizing Collegify's analytics in this way enables you to really understand the nature of your weaknesses, uh, which could be to do with timing and test taking strategy. It also allows me to understand that even though these questions might have all been right, clearly you do actually have difficulty with whatever those areas are. Um, and again, that's something that's easy to miss unless you're using a very detailed and complex platform like Collegify. You can really drill down to exactly why you're getting answers wrong um, or why you're spending too much time on them um, and what, what question category those sit in. So you're able to look past just the simple matter of right and wrong um, and really start to improve your scores in terms of how you spend your time in the test situation. Um, and this is a high pressure test and it does take a lot of time to adjust yourself to that fast paced environment. Um, and this graph and going through it methodically is to my mind, probably the most useful way that you can begin to understand how to improve. We then have the performance by question difficulty. Um, which if it looks like this, where I'm seeing a student that's getting more, most of the hard questions wrong, I don't tend to be concerned. It means that we should just simply focus on the basic ground rules and the basic teaching of these different topics. Um, and then the hard questions usually come with time. What I have seen and what is concerning is, you know, a sort of 80% correct on hard questions, almost 100% correct on easy questions, and then only 20%, so a huge red bar for medium, which means that this is a, a student who's prone to skipping questions, a student who's prone to thinking that they know the answer before they've really checked through and adopted the strategy of coming to their own answer first, and then looking through the four different um, multiple choice options that they're given. Finally, in the insight section, we can really see how progress is changing on over time um, through these different graphs. Um, some of them will have dips in them that enable us to understand where, as, as a snapshot in time, where the student might, might have been having some difficulty. And we, could, we can also monitor the ongoing impact of lessons and any tuition that might be happening onto the performance over time of the student. And we can also understand how that improvement is um, rated in terms of, in relative terms with these different badges. And this can also be changed for the reading test, for example. So some more tests need to be taken, but um, what, what will happen is where there's a dip, we can actually then zoom into the papers specific to where that dip takes place and very specifically identify what's been going wrong there, um, which is a, a very, very powerful tool for teachers and for those of you who are self-studying as well. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the presentation now, so bear with me one moment. So we've just had the Collegify platform uh, overview, um, which brings me on to my last slide. Um, and I just want to finish with some information as well as summarizing what I've said. So there are nuances clearly between the SAT and ACT, and it's really crucial that you don't leave this to get guesswork. It's very important that 
um, we apply the power of analytics, um, which rests on the many, many thousands of students who've taken uh, not only diagnostic tests, but also worksheets um, and full SAT mocks. And we use that pool of data to orient ourselves towards what's going to give us the best outcome for our learning habits and, and how our brains work. So do, do please take the diagnostic test by the SAT, uh, the Collegify SAT ACT portal. Um, it will allow you to identify your relative strengths and weaknesses, of course, but it will also show you whether you have a predisposition to do better at the SAT or the ACT. And when we're talking about 50 points here and there, or two or three points in the ACT, that can actually be the difference between getting into the college of your dreams and not. Um, it's a very, very competitive field. So really succeeding is the sum of all differences. Um, as as um, they used to say in British cycling, when they were redesigning the team that year, when the British won a lot of gold medals, um, they said it was the sum of small differences that really made the team perform best. Um, any one of which you could pick out and say was kind of an irrelevant detail, but put together gives you that 10% advantage that no other team had. So think of yourselves in that way. You're trying to collect and collate the sum of small differences here. Um, but I would actually say understanding the difference between the SAT and ACT is a huge difference. Um, I also want to advocate that in practice and testing, you apply a form of mindful reading to what you're doing. What do I mean by that? I don't want you to race through your texts. I think um, success, in my experience, uh, always comes from students who try to mindfully visualize or hear in their mind's eye or ear the reading voice of the text that they're reading. The reason for that is you don't have to revisit that text usually. And that when you're under time pressure, a lot of the right answers adapt, uh, they present themselves straight away before you've even reread re re the text or before you've even looked at the answers. And just bearing in mind that a lot of the test questions, especially the ones that concern themselves about um, the overall meaning of a text or uh, the author's view on a specific point, they often require a very careful understanding of tone. And tone is what we miss when we race through a text. So have your own personal set of colored pens, pencils, highlighters, or whatever, and do read the text, each and every one, very slowly and carefully once before you turn to the questions. Um, adopting an holistic approach. So quite apart from this mindful attitude to test taking, it's important that we look more widely to what else is going on in our lives. Given that, for instance, uh, sleeping for five hours rather than a full seven or eight can reduce cognitive function by 30% in IQ and similar tests. Um, we have to pay attention to the state in which we arrive at the exam on test day. So do practice, do understand the analytics of the Collegify platform, do take the diagnostic test, of course, um, but do also start to practice by bringing your waking up time and your sleeping time in line with when you're going to have to be waking up for the test and start doing this at least two weeks before you, you begin. So use that widget in the top right of the Collegify platform that I showed you to really start planning how you're going to gently ease towards an earlier start. Um, so if you're going to have to get up at six, start moving your sleep back by 15 minute increments. Do also pay attention to your diet. You will need a complex mix of carbohydrates and fruits uh, and vegetables, especially in the morning of the test. Um, it's good to have helped um, your body by weaning itself off caffeine. 
Um, at least then if you do drink caffeine on test day, it's going to have an, a much more of an effect. Um, some light exercise also has been proven to improve cognitive ability um, in the region of 10 to 30 percent again. Um, this can be something as simple as just going for a walk for 15 minutes outside. Um, or you could do some yoga or go for a swim or a run if you're more sporty. But my point here is do whatever is appropriate to your interest and your fitness level and just keep it consistent and do this every day in the last two week phase before the exam and you will reap the benefits in the, in the exam hall. And then finally, um, it gives me actually a, a lot of ple pleasure to be able to tell all of you that those who sign up with uh, Collegify um, do get access to the Waking Up app uh, free for at least one month. And then for those of you who can't afford a four year subscription, which I think is $80, you can simply email the team via the app and they know that Collegify are using the app and they'll give you a full year subscription for free. Um, and mindfulness is simply um, being training your focus, your mental focus, and does have um, neurologically proven results in terms of people's ability to focus. Okay, so that takes me to my final, uh, my final screen where I've had it added a link to the diagnostic test and I've given my email. Um, so guys, please do drop me a line if you have any further questions and do get onto the diagnostic test um, so you can better understand what direction you'd like to um, you'd like to start off in, whether it's SAT or ACT, in the full assurance that you've made the right decision. Um, based on all of the data that Collegify is there to, to support you with. Many thanks for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, over email in due course. Is the Mindler team there? Thank you, Andreas. Thank you for the amazing uh, insights into the two tests. And okay. of course, insights into the Collegify platform. Hi guys, this is Praveen the side. I would now take you through the SAT math, like Andreas has taken you through the SAT verbal, ACT verbal. I would now take you through the maths on the two tests. But before we do that, I would like to talk about something that uh, is really important, is definitely important for anything, not just a test. So something that we call as goal setting. Now, goal setting is really, really important for anything that we do in life, unless I know what my goals are, unless I know what things am I looking at, it becomes a little really difficult for anyone to figure out what do I aim for. For example, like as Andreas clearly pointed out, improvements on the test, like a 300 point improvement on the test can take you from one school, which is a little lower ranked, to a high end school generally known in India as Ivy Leagues, the world over the people. Like if I ask a student generally, or oh, what schools are you aiming for? They are generally aiming for an Ivy League. So there is the goal setting is really, really important. And we should all try to look at that. So that's what we would be talking about. How do we really set our goals? And as Andreas also clearly pointed out towards the end, take your diagnostic. Because unless you take your diagnostic, there would we can't really suggest what goal realistically should you be taking. So I'm just giving you a random example. So when a student, average student starts on the test, like preparing for either the SAT or the ACT, 
they generally start with a score somewhere in the 50th to the 60th percentile range so i'm not saying they score 50 60 percent i'm saying i'm saying that they score somewhere between 50th to 60th percentile range that is they are still about 50 to 40 percent students who are better than them at this current state that is their first diagnostic test so let's talk about the two tests on the sat the 50th percentile score currently is about a thousand something on a 1600 on the act the 50th percentile score is somewhere between a 24 and a 25 on a scale score of 36. so if you are starting around that depending on how much time do you have to your test so for example there are students who start just like two months in advance of the test which is really a bad strategy it doesn't take that small a time to improve it does take a little more time to improve on these tests some students start really early like they take their first attempt in class 10 then maybe another attempt if required during class 11 However, we strongly suggest that you should at least on a minimum give your test preparation three to four months. An average student can in these three to four months, if puts his attention to the test, puts his energies on improving his scores, can easily take the score up by 200 points easily. As also Abhishek sir mentioned at the start, at college five we have seen students improving their scores by an average of 230 plus points so that means if you spend just about three months with the college five platform learning doing your work through it so i'm not just saying oh you sign up and you sit down for three months but you need to definitely work through you need to take your diagnostic tests you need to do your lessons you need to look at the videos that the college five platform offers <laughs> and definitely answer each and every question on the <clears throat> on the worksheets that we have at different levels so you always even if let's say you are someone who is really good at a particular topic let's say exponents is something your favorite you are amazing at that you have never got a question incorrect on, uh, on exponents we still strongly suggest that you look into the easy questions for those so do not skip a question on the test unless definitely you are running short of your total time towards the test. But if you are someone who is starting three months in advance, you would have enough time to answer each question on the test on the platform. The def uh, advantage of doing each question, even if it's a is, is an easy question from a topic which you are really good with, you are a pro at that topic, is that you would avoid making any silly errors why am i really talking about silly errors because math surprisingly is the place where most students end up making a silly error like that's the most common kind of error on the test on the math test silly errors because oh in a hurry i just forgot that a two to the power zero is actually a one and not a zero or something similar so goal setting is highly important and you would be able to set a goal for yourself only and only if one you have taken your diagnostic two you have taken your diagnostic really seriously you're not just taking it as uh, there's some test that i just need to do you need to make sure that you're taking your diagnostic as seriously as you would take your final test whether sat or act Third, whatever your score on the diagnostic. So let's say I'm assuming that you are starting with the ACT, you get a 24 on the ACT to start with on your diagnostic. Your, your realistic score improvement on the ACT then should be somewhere about four to five points. So whatever is your diagnostic score, look at a plus four or five onto that uh, ACT score for the final test. On the SAT, because the scores are in the multiples of 10s, you can look forward to an improvement of about 100 to 150 points in a short period of three months. If you definitely start a little more earlier, maybe somewhere about six months, you can easily jump your scores by more than 300 points on the SAT and by more than 10 points on the ACT. 
So be very regular, do your tests, do your diagnostics, do your questions, do not skip the video lessons or the text lessons in between the quality on the quality five platform between your question sets. A lot of students we have seen, they skip these lessons just because they see, feel, oh, I know this stuff. However much, again, I'm just repeating, however much you know that stuff, it doesn't hurt to revise that uh, topic once again. Just go over it. None of our videos, none of our lessons would take you more than four minutes. So you just need to spend four minutes to revise the whole concept, go to the uh, worksheets, more confident, apply your learning to those questions, see your results improving, and you would definitely be on your path to a great SAT or ACT score, which is definitely an, a requirement by most of the top schools. Right, so now we talk about the math test on the SAT and the ACT. I'm skipping the first screen because this is something that you have already uh, looked into when Andrea Sir was talking about this. So you know the basic differences between the two tests. There are four sections on the ACT. There are four sections on the SAT, but the ACT, the fourth section is science, whereas on the SAT, the fourth section is also a math section. So let's talk about the difference between the two tests, the SAT math versus the ACT math. So on the ACT math, the math is always the second section, just after your English. So your first section is English, where you are tested on grammar rules. The next section tests you on math. The number of questions that you need to answer on the ACT math is 60, six zero. So that's a lot of questions that you need to answer on the ACT math. Then the total time given, of course, is 60 minutes. That makes it about a minute or 60 seconds per question. Sounds like a good time looking at, okay, 60 minutes, 60 questions. So I have about a minute per question. Sounds like a good time looking at the kind of time that they had given you for the ACT English and the ACT reading sections. So uh, that way ACT has been a little generous for us on the math. However, 60 questions in 60 minutes for a lot of students is a little challenging. But make sure that you're not really worried about because the ACT math, the first few questions are so simple to answer that you would most probably answer the first 10 questions in first two minutes straight, saving a lot of time for the later difficulty questions. Another thing that you need to keep in mind on the ACT math is uh, that the difficulty level of questions increases as the number, the question number increases. So that means if I'm on question number one versus you are on question number 10, you are most probably solving a more difficult question currently than what I am doing. So a question number one is the easiest question on the test and Question number 60 is the most difficult question on the test. So this is what we have to keep in mind about the ACT math. On the SAT math, as I just said, there are two sections. There in place of the science, which is on the ACT test, the SAT gives you a, another math section. So on the SAT math, you see two sections of math, which is the third section and the fourth section. That is the final two sections on the test. The third section is always the no calculator section. That means for those questions, you are not allowed to use your calculator. The fourth section, however, allows you to use your calculator. Just as the ACT math allows you throughout, the SAT has made it to test you on both your understanding without the calculator and of course your understanding of the use of the calculator if required at all. The no calculator section on the SAT math has 20 questions. The total time given is 25 minutes. So that makes the time per question is 75 seconds. 
the fourth section has 38 questions in total. The total time given is 55 minutes and the time given per question is 87 seconds. So clearly, as we can see, SAT gives us more time per question than what, does, what the ACT does. So, but does that make the SAT math easier than the ACT math just because I have more time per question? No, not really, right? Because just because I have a little extra time per question doesn't mean that the questions that I'm facing on the test are easier compared to the other test. Definitely, it gives me a little more confidence in terms of completing the test in time, but it doesn't make the questions any less worthy of spending your best time on to those approaches that you are applying to the questions. So why does extra time not really help me on the SAT math is because generally the questions on the SAT math are slightly more wordier than what the ACT math questions are. ACT math questions generally are very straightforward. You can expect to see a question like, what is the value of sine 40 degrees on ACT math? But that's a question that you can never expect to see on the new SAT math. The SAT math doesn't test you on questions that straightforward. If the SAT has to ask you a similar question, which is, what is the value of sine 40 degrees? The SAT would most probably give you a story to read around and then finally find the value of SAT 40 degrees looking at a figure or maybe you creating a figure by yourself through that story. Now let's look at the slight more detailed differences between the two tests. On the ACT math, each question that you see has five answer choices. Whereas on the SAT math, each question has four answer choices. So they are all MCQs, but there are five answer choices on the math for ACT and there are four answer choices on the MCQ questions for the SAT. One less answer choice to choose between and that definitely improved my chances of getting a correct answer on a question where I have no idea how to answer that question, but if I need to guess, because on the ACT math, when you guess between five answer choices, you just have 20% chances of getting that correct. Whereas on the AC, on the SAT math, when you have to pick between four answer choices, you have 25% chances of getting that correct. Next, as I just pointed out, the ACT math questions are fairly straightforward. You can expect to really see some very simple questions on the test. Whereas on the SAT math, that's not true. There are really long word problems. You spend a lot of your time on reading the questions carefully rather than really solving these questions. The SAT math gives you a small formula sheet at the start of both the sections. That is the first sheet on the third section and the fourth section has some formulas for you to have a reference. These formulas include special triangles, circles, quadrilaterals. So there is slightly a help, a little help in terms of you not really remembering all the formulas. On the ACT math, however, you do not have a formula list at all. You need to know each of your formulas the right way to answer each question correctly on the test. The ACT math, however, tests you on slightly more topics than what the SAT does. For example, trigonometry is tested in a lot more detail on ACT than on the SAT. The SAT trigonometry is very basic where you just need to know a question such as what are the simple trigonometric terms, sine, cos, tan. But for the ACT math, you would need to know the inverse formulas also. Another example is ACT math tests you on 
uh, topics such as logarithms, whereas SAT math does not test you on logarithms at all. Then a very good thing on both the tests since the SAT has changed in 2016 is that there is no negative marking on either of the tests now. That means whether you are running out of time or you are stuck badly on a question, you have no idea how to answer that. You should not simply skip that blank. Mark all your answers. Make sure that you have marked all your answers on the test because in either case, you have a slight chance to get that correct. And even if you miss, it up, miss out on it completely, still you are not losing any marks. There's no negative marking. Another big difference between the SAT math and the ACT math is that <clears throat> the SAT math has question types which are not on ACT math, which are known as gridding questions. So the gridding questions are the ones where you have to solve a question, but you do not see any answer choices to pick your answer. Instead, you have to write your answers down. So there is a grid that you see, you need to put in your answers on that. And that's a question type that is never tested on the ACT math. ACT math is completely multiple choice. SAT math on each section has a few questions which are gridins. So gridin questions, as we have seen, does make students slightly slower as there are no answer choices to make a guess. In case you are stuck, you have no choice but to put in an answer. Just a trick that I would tell you here is if you are stuck on a SAT grid in math question, make sure that you are not marking a negative answer. Negatives are not possible as answers on the grid in questions. You can only have zero or any positive number as your answer. Decimals definitely are allowed again if they are positive. So a point one can be my answer, but a negative one cannot be my answer on the SAT math grid in questions. So now what do we need to do to do well on these tests? The two tests definitely test you on very, very, very similar topics. However, you need to definitely know who focuses a little more on what. So just to give you an idea, about 33% of your math test on the SAT is about linear equations. So you need to know your variables really well. You need to know your X, Y, Z's. How do you use them? How to create equations out of them really, really well. Whereas on the ACT math, linear equations make only 10% of the test. So that means if you are someone who is good with linear equations, linear algebra, then SAT math is the test for you to do rather than ACT math. Similarly, if you are someone who is good with matrices, trigonometry, logarithms, then ACT is the test for you to do because the SAT doesn't test you on those topics. So you need to know these differences to make the best choice between the two tests, especially in terms of the math. However, of course, just based on the math, you cannot decide I need to do the ACT or the SAT. So you have to Keep in mind your strengths and weaknesses as discussed by Andrea sir earlier between the reading and the writing tests. So if you feel that overall you are someone more fit for ACT, go ahead with that. Overall, if you feel you are more fit for the SAT, go ahead with that. How can you get to know which test is more suited for me? There is nothing better than taking a diagnostic test. Because you might be feeling, oh, I'm really good with the topics for math on the SAT, but I'm not as good for the topics for the verbal, that is the reading and the writing sections on the SAT, but the 
writing and the reading on the ACT suits me better. I am now stuck. How do we do? How do I decide between the two tests? So to help you there, one, you can definitely sit and take the diagnostic for each of them, a complete full length diagnostic for SAT and a full length diagnostic for ACT. However, the Collegify team understanding that a lot of students would not have so much time to decide between SAT and ACT by taking a full length test for both of them, which is about in total makes it about eight hours. The Collegify team has created a test which tests you on SAT and ACT at the same time. And you can visit the website to take the SAT versus ACT test there. So you can decide based on that, how do you take the SAT versus ACT test? So there is an AC, SAT versus ACT uh, test that you do, which is, which doesn't take you eight hours to do for sure. So you can be certain about not spending a lot of time on that test. At the end of the test, it tells you, it gives you a score on the SAT and your score on the ACT. And just by looking at those scores, the detailed score report that you get, you can decide which test is more suited to you rather than just sitting right now and looking at the different topics that are tested on the two tests. So we strongly suggest go ahead, work out on your diagnostics. You can choose to do just the SAT diagnostic, just the ACT diagnostic or take the SAT versus ACT diagnostic in case you are confused between which test to do. Now we are open for any questions, any doubts that any of you have. And we definitely request all of you as we are all connected from different parts of the world right now, we request you to leave your feedback with the Mindler team or any other questions that you might not fe uh, be feeling right now to ask with the minor team again. If you have any questions to ask currently, we are all open to your questions now. Any questions, anyone? Hello, this is Harpal from the Mindler team. And if anybody have a question, they can unmute their mic, have a mic and ask the question. Make sure you do that, do that one, one by one and not uh, rush it. So you can unmute your mic and ask the question if anybody has a question. Thank you. Joshua Tiju has asked, uh, what is the duration of the ACT SAT test on the link that we have shared? Uh, so Joshua, it's a full length diagnostic that you need to do. So it follows exactly the time duration that the real tests does. So that means uh, it would take you approximately about four hours to complete the test. Any other questions that anyone else has? Uh, Haridas, uh, I did not really get your question correctly. Like you are talking about, uh, ACT, SAT scoring on the map, the SAT scores out of a total of 800, the ACT scores you on a scale of 36. Uh, if that's what you are looking for, I've answered the question. If you have something else to ask, please be a little more specific. To get a perfect score, you need to get everything correct. Like on most ACTs, even if you just get one incorrect answer, you would not get a 36.
and the same is true even for the sat like even if you make just one error you most probably would not get a 800 gap between 32 to 36 how many questions there is no set formula for either the act or the sat as the tests keep changing the scoring as slightly from test to test depending on the level of difficulty of the questions however to score between a 32 and a 36 a student would generally be making about 4 to 5 extra questions correct like on a difficult test you would have to answer just about 3 questions in addition correct to get to a perfect score on a really simple test you would have to most probably make about 7 to 8 questions correct to get that additional score but on an average you can take it between 4 to 6 additional questions to get correct uh, to get fill that gap of 32 to 36 how many times can this test be taken by a student uh, you can uh, the scoring does change slightly with each test for example let's say if i have to if i am taking the test today and i get four incorrect and i get a score of x on the next attempt when i get the same four errors my score might be a slightly up or down depending on how the other students on that test are doing so your test score is not fixed between the tests the it does keep changing you can look into the scoring given by the sat on the 10 tests that they have uh, that they publish you can look at the scoring and you would understand that it does change slightly with each test like doesn't change a lot but does change slightly and similarly you can look at the act scores on the test that they have published so that you can understand that the scores change slightly with each test uh ridesh asked uh, how many times can this test be taken by a student so ridesh we can take the test as many times as we like uh in your lifetime however strongly suggested not to take more than 3 times like do not take more than 3 attempts on a test it goes bad for you then got off for getting a scholarship uh like that's a very difficult question to answer the reason is the scholarships depend on a lot more factors just on this score and uh, the scholarships do change from the criteria does change from school to school so there is no fixed formula to get a scholarship anyone else who has any questions do we have advanced topics like conics in act uh, no the act doesn't test you on conics even the sat doesn't so conics is not tested on either of these tests pre calculus yes is tested a little on the act so for example relations functions is tested on both the tests polynomials is tested on both the tests 
exponential functions are majorly tested on the act very slightly on the sat so pre calculus is dull, uh, is tested on the tests How many questions come in vectors and matrices? Uh, there are no questions for vectors on either of the tests. The ACT might give you one question on matrices. Like we have never seen more than one question on any of the tests. And it is not even compulsory to get that one test. It may be that you might see no uh, you might see no questions on matrices. Will SAT become online? Uh, again, we are not the people to really comment on that. However, they have been looking forward to go online since long now. It's been more than four years that they have been planning. So we can't say, will they go online for sure? Uh, it's not just the SAT test, it's almost every test across the globe which are getting cancelled due to Corona. Uh, so yes, that's something that's an external factor. None of us have a possibility to control that. So we can just plan the test dates and keep looking at what tests are possible. Uh, universities have already started exempting the SAT. so. There are a lot of universities who are test optional this year, but it is strongly suggested that you still take your test, whether the SAT or the ACT, and then apply to these universities. That improves your chances like heavily. Anyone else who has any doubts, any questions related to the platform, the SAT, the ACT, the math, the verbal, anything that you have? What is the importance of the SAT essay versus the ACT essay? Uh, both the essays are there to test, test you on your uh, thinking skills in terms of the pressure thinking because you are on a test they are looking at do you read well do you comprehend what is given do you understand how passages are written because both the tests both the essays would want you not to really give your thoughts in whether it was a good uh, passage or it was it a bad passage they want to look at do you understand the literary devices? How does one thing impact uh, the whole passage completely in terms, for example, if there's a passage which is talking about heavy with heavy words, was the choice of heavy words, was the choice of those words correct? So that's what they want to understand through this. So the universities, when they look at your essay scores, they just understand if you are someone who is uh, how good are you with your language in terms of the literary devices?
ACT, SAT are specific to America only or are expected in Europe, Australia or elsewhere. Uh, US colleges have, uh, they make it compulsory uh, for the students to take ACT, SAT for admissions. Colleges in Canada also accept these scores, like especially the top ones. Colleges in Europe have also started looking into your SAT, ACT scores. If you apply to Singapore schools with your SAT, ACT scores, you can even get some scholarships for that. So there is a lot of use for these tests, not just specific to the America. Delin, Joshua, Mona, Prashant, Trishna, Yogesh, any questions that any of you have? If you have any question, you can unmute your mic and ask, or you can even send in to the chat. Thank you. Prashant would like to learn first. So Prashant, you can visit Collegify website. Uh, you would see a lot of blogs there, which would help you understand most of your uh, doubts regarding these tests. Uh, you can read through those blogs. You can definitely try the Collegify platform to maybe try the ACT versus SAT test, which would help you decide between the two tests in a easier way. Okay, so uh, we feel there are no more questions currently. If you have any other questions, anything that comes to your mind, you can definitely write to the Mindler team. We would definitely get back to you with a detailed answer as soon as we can. Uh, Prashant has a doubt, B group NEET student won't be able to score in maths. Uh, I am not sure Prashant who are B group need students. I'm really sorry on that. If you can be a little more specific on this, like then maybe I would be able to answer your question. Right. So if you have any doubts, any questions after this, uh, after we stop here, uh, you can email your doubts or queries to hello at mindler.com and we would make sure that we get back to you with detailed answers. Okay, so Prashant has suggested students who have not done math maybe in class 11 and 12. So Prashant, not to really worry about that because a lot of students actually who have do not have math in class 11 and 12, uh, they end up doing the SAT and ACT and they do pretty well because most of the questions tested on the math are class 10 level, except a few small topics such as functions, which is most probably taken care of in class 11. Yes, right. The SAT and the ACT math is very basic. You just need to be regular with your practice. You should not be worried about most of the topics that you are doing in class 11 and 12. So, uh, so from the Mindler team, you can now take over if you have something. Otherwise, I think they don't have any further questions to ask. 
so we can most probably wait for their questions on your email id and then reply to them Okay, so uh, as we can't see any further questions coming, we would stop here. In case of any doubts, any questions, please feel free to write to hello at mindler.com. If you have any question, you can write to us at hello at mindler.com or if you have a, I have a question right now, you can send it through chat or you can even unmute or write an and 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 you know, I can ask the question as well. Okay, so we see no more questions. Uh, best of luck for your future guys. Stay on track, keep prepping, and I'm sure all of you would finally get a great score on the test. So bye, best of luck, and keep prepping. Hi everyone, uh, this is Raghu here from the Mindler team. Um, thank you all for joining in. Um, I would request you all to uh, check out the platform by clicking on the link. Um, it's definitely a very useful uh, tool for anybody who is planning to prepare for SAT or ACT. And uh, we will be conducting more such interesting uh, boot camps and webinars going ahead. Um, I request you all to stay tuned and keep joining in. Um, you can uh, write to us at hello at the rate mindler.com and share your queries. Um, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, thank you Collegify team. Thank you Praveen for uh, uh, conducting such a great and uh, insightful session. Thank you so much for that.